On Law Weekly today, we talk to a senior advocate of Nigeria, Femi Atoyebi, ahead of the decision of the National Judicial Council, NJC, on the suspended Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Walter Onoge, and the Acting Chief Justice, Ibrahim Tanko. We look at issues of morality, legality, and the intervention by some senior advocates which they have tagged a justice reform project. What is the project about? We'll find out shortly. We also have a recap of the top trending stories from the courts. Hello and welcome to the program. I am Shola Shoyeli. We begin with our interview segment. Senior advocate of Nigeria, Femi Atoyebi, has practiced law for over 35 years. He says he's worried about the widespread perception that there's corruption in the judiciary. So worried that he and some like-minded senior advocates are pushing for urgent reforms. In this interview, I began by asking his views on the trial of the suspended Chief Justice of Nigeria on charges of non-declaration of assets. We have two things. First is the legality, which those who believe or who argue about the rule of law are hammering on. And then we have the morality of the case itself. Now, from the things we've read in newspapers and social media, the CGN has been charged or arraigned before the CCT for either making false declaration of his asset or refusing or forgetting to declare some asset after he had attained the office as CGN. There is also the statement credited to him, which interestingly he hasn't denied. His statement is also on the social media, in which he said or admitted, oh, I forgot to make certain declarations, or I made a mistake. There was a particular sentence in his statement in which it was reported to have said that he did not know that one or two of those accounts were in existence at the time he was making the declaration. In, this was as at November of that year. Interestingly, from the bank statements also attached to the uh, uh, charge as proof of evidence, about five tranches of payments of cash in dollars were made into the account. So the first question for me to my mind is if he didn't know the account existed, how did those who paid the money into it pay the money into it? So my general view is that he's become tinted as a chief justice of this country. The allegations are more than mere allegations. He has accepted or admitted some of them. So to my mind, the honorable thing for him to do, he shouldn't have waited for them to charge him. Honorably, he should have just resigned his appointment. So the morality is one thing, but the way that the government has gone about it, talking about the legality now, issues of due process, do you think that they've done the right thing? I believe that charging him to the, or before the CCT, is the appropriate thing to do. I do not share the view of those who argue that for the kind of offense he's been charged, he should first go to the NJC. I've seen, I've read a lot of cases on this. And pe lawyers have argued, as you said, on the side of the right, of the left. One thing that is clear is that, in my humble view, for the kind of offense he's charged, the Ngajua's case specifically says such an offense does not have to be referred to NJC first and it could be charged directly before the CCT. In another case, decided by the Supreme Court in which the current CJN was a member, even his own contribution specifically says for offenses under the CCB Act, it says they are only tribal before the CCT. Code of conduct of Indeed. That is his own decision. So if we go by those two decisions, with which I respectfully agree, I can find nothing wrong 
or improper in what the government has done by charging him there rather than going to the NJC. I believe the NJC was set up, amongst other things, to handle cases of professional misconduct by judges, but this is a quasi-criminal one. That's one point that we need to understand. And I don't think the Constitution confers the jurisdiction over criminal matters or quasi-criminal matters on the NJC. It's on the court or the tribunal, as the case may be. In this case, I would submit it's the CCT that has uh, uh, the appropriate jurisdiction. Now, you and some other senior advocates, 20 of you, have come out with some sort of intervention, which you call the Justice Reform Project. You say that it's to examine the factors that have engendered the undoubted loss of confidence in the judiciary and the legal profession, and to prefer suggestions for a much-needed reform. Tell us about that. I think we're all agreed on one thing, and that is that the judicial system is corrupt. And the level is pervasive. It's extremely worrying to us. And by the way, I would say to you that we're not just 20. That's just the people who started. Uh, since then, we received a lot of calls in, uh, messages of goodwill from a lot of our colleagues, both in the inner bar and outer bar. We have even received a lot of encouraging messages from people who are not lawyers, but who believe in the, in the course that we stood up for. It just happens that the core of this group started in Lagos, people of like minds. Now, what binds us together is not where you come from, but our value system. Those who try to argue that the judiciary, or indeed our profession, is not being corrupted, they are living in denial. We propose what we call a long-term, mid-term, and short-term reforms. Some that have to be done right now, some that will be done within the next one to two years, and some over, over three to five years. On the long term, for instance, you, you find out a lot of the reforms we we'll have loved to prefer. We would have difficulties because of constitutional or legislative provisions that would not allow us to do that, would impede us from doing that. So in the long term, we hope to be able to take such steps as would assist in amending the various laws, including the Constitution. And so this is going to be not just for the 20 of us or the group, whatever size we may be, but we will need every good-minded uh, good Nigerian from all walks of life to assist in that. And of course, the major things we can do are, one, we need to begin to read the Riot Act to corrupt judges and lawyers. We need to set up monitoring committees. We need to find a way of getting feedback from the uh, members of the public and other members of the bar who choose to do it right. So if you find a judge or a lawyer who's involved in those corrupt, who continues to be involved in those corrupt acts, we'll call them out. Of course, uh, uh, there's so much into those. I'm just trying to paraphrase what we intend to do, but I can't even give you the details of, for obvious reasons how we're going to accomplish that. With all that has happened with the CJN, do you think that it was proper for the acting CJN to have presented himself for swearing in, especially against the background of what some have said is a similar situation which played out sometime back in Abia State? There are two issues. The first is the order, the ex party order of the CCT. That order says, I think it was issued sometime, was it the 24th or 23rd of January or so? It says that it is ordered that the uh, CJN should step aside. Okay? And then it says the president should take steps to appoint the next most senior judge so that there's no vacuum in government. As you know, nature will have all vacuum. So there cannot be a vacuum. 
if he was stepping aside or suspended, not dismissed, someone has to act. Now, so he was then called and sworn in as acting CJN, I believe pending the resolution of the issue of the suspension of the substantive CJN. Now, you are referring to the case of the CJ of one state in the East, Abia State, who, who went to be sworn in, and the NJC said, we should have recommended you. We haven't done that. On that basis, we will suspend you. In my view, the fact of that case is distinguishable from the present one of the acting CJN. What's the difference? In the Abia, Abia State case, there was no order of court asking the substantive CJ to step aside. Neither was there an order to say that the next most senior should be sworn in. In this case, both were present. Of course, we can argue till tomorrow about the legality of the order. And I can also argue both ways for that order. But for now, the issue is there is an order. Then the president invites him to come in, post one to that order. Now, as I understand the law, and I don't lay claim to know it all, but the law seems to be that every order of court, even if it is manifestly illegal, you have to obey it until it is set aside. So many cases decided by the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, and all the superior courts. And so, while you can attack the order on whatever grounds, whether you succeed or not is another thing, the point is there is an order in place. So I would, I would not see anything wrong. Because to see if he doesn't, he's been asked to step aside. There will be a vacuum. This, we are talking of governance. So would a nation as large and complicated as ours be without the head of the judiciary? I don't think so. But does it not bother you the speed with which this order was executed, especially when you consider that there have been some court orders in the past that this government has simply disobeyed? First of all, in the way that the government has chosen not to obey some orders, for me it's condemnable, it's unacceptable by any standard. I will not condone it. And if I had a chance to say this to them directly, I will. Now, but as to the speed of complying with this order, there's nothing wrong with that. The only problem is that they probably chose which one they wanted to obey because I know there are some orders which they have not obeyed for quite a while, which is not right. But you can't fault anybody for obeying a court order uh, uh, um, if you decide to do so promptly. We're going into elections in a few days. What role would you expect the judiciary to play in the elections and even post-elections? Well, for me, I'm one of those who believe that as much as possible, and I'm speaking for myself now, we should allow the electorate to determine who rule them. In other words, we should make the vote count. But of course, where there are challenges to the elections, what we then do, in effect, is to transfer the power and the right of the electorate to a committee of three or four tribunal members or judges who then, in their wisdom, decide who is the winner. So my preference would be, first of all, as best we can to get the electorate to decide the outcome of all elections. Of course, that, that's, that's just um, mere wishes. In Nigeria particularly, ultimately we will end up in court. And that's where the judges are, where they come in. I would expect all judges who get appointed to the, to the various tribunal of tribunals, as well as the appellate court, Court of Appeal and Supreme Court, to know that it cannot be business as usual. The CJN has run into serious trouble with the allegations against him. I think it would be foolhardy for any judge with his eyes open who still has a name to protect to try and submit himself 
to corruption, to being used by one party or the other. It's coming to a stage where if we don't do something now, members of the public will begin to throw stones at judges and lawyers for what they perceive to be corruption. So I guess every judge should be on his toe now. Because if they don't, we will cut them out.